everybody, welcome back to class. Last week and the last several weeks we've been talking about the kinds of things that that bear upon individuals decision-making process. We talked about in things like individual differences, moral cognitive development, moral disengagement. We talked about individual kinds of issues, the types, types of uh, things that are typically problematic in an organization, the types of concerns that come up. This week though we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about the larger, broader organizational context. That's right, we're going to talk about ethics and organizational culture. And those of you that took my organizational behavior class or somebody else's organizational behavior class probably remember a little something about organizational culture, at least I hope you do. It's this larger context, the culture, the values, the worldview, the assumptions, the heroes, the myths, the role modeling, the norms, all those kinds of things. And as you can imagine, those have all have a lot to do with setting the tone for the ethical climate. So we're going to go through many of these points in this week's lecture. We're going to talk about the formal systems and the informal systems. We're going to talk about how you might even be able to change the ethical climate, the ethical culture, rather, in your own organization. So hang on while we do a whirlwind tour through the world of ethics and organizational culture. Here's a quick overview of the topics we're going to cover in this week's lesson. Organizational ethics as culture, ethical culture, looking at a multi-system framework, ethical leadership, other formal cultural systems, informal cultural systems, organizational climates, developing and changing ethical culture, a cultural approach to changing organizational ethics, and the ethics of managing organizational ethics. All right, so this uh, little model here should be familiar by now. It's appeared several times in the textbook. Um, you'll see that there's this uh, continuum. Uh, it starts with an individual's ethical awareness, which leads to the individual's ethical judgment, and then the ethical action. Now, last week we talked about things like individual differences and how the individual differences influenced uh, the degree to which people think, saw things as ethical issues, uh, their judgment, right? So things like uh, uh, Machiavellianism, uh, uh, moral development, uh, moral disengagement, right? So these were all kinds of individual differences that influenced people. Now the, the new variable that we're introducing into the model this week is the one on the bottom called ethical culture. And I would call ethical culture really the, the environment, uh, the larger context in which individuals uh, make decisions, ethical decisions, right? So it's sort of the, uh, the, 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 the overall context for, by which people make individual decisions. Because we all know that uh, people do not uh, work, they do not exist uh, in a vacuum, right? We all work together with others. And so the culture is, is part of what bears upon people's uh, ethical decision making. Okay, so let's look at this idea of organizational culture. What is culture? Uh, it can be looked at as uh, something which expresses shared assumptions, values, and beliefs, and is the social glue that holds the organization together. It's how we do things around here. Okay, so notice there's a couple key things in there. Assumptions. And uh, what's an assumption? Well, an assumption is something that everybody believes to be true, uh, but they don't talk about, right? And that's what makes culture tricky, is uh, oftentimes culture is a reality that we just take for granted and nobody really stops to, to think about and articulate. Uh, values are, you know, things that we believe are good or true or right or wrong. Uh, they may be expressed, they may not be expressed, all right? Um, another thing here is that there are different types of cultures. There's a strong culture and a weak culture. And a strong culture uh, says that the assumptions, value, beliefs are widely shared, right? So they're widely shared and they're deeply held. So everybody understands them, everybody knows what the culture's about, uh, and for the most part they, they have bought into that. Then there's a weak culture where subgroup norms have more influence, all right? So the overall organizational culture is not as strong here, uh, but individual group culture uh, has a particular sway. So think about in a typical organization uh, where you have, for example, maybe a marketing department or a research department, and those ones might have a stronger uh, sense of culture in themselves than the overall organizational culture does. Another description of culture is a, a body of learned beliefs, traditions, and guides for behavior shared among 
members of a society or group. Okay, so with that definition right there, you can you know pretty much see why this is such an important topic when it comes to uh, when it comes to ethics. Because what are we talking about at the end of the day here? We are talking about managing ethical behavior. And so if culture is is the belief system in which people's behavior is enacted uh, and shared, then you can see if you have a, you know, just to make it real simple, if you have a healthy ethical culture, then that is going to guide people's uh, beliefs and, and behavior. Uh, conversely, if you have a, a culture that puts up with lots of ethical ambiguity, that plays fast and loose with the rules, where people know it's okay to cheat, that's just sort of the way we do things around here, right? Uh, those are our learned beliefs, that's what we've inherited, that's you know what we see modeled, etc. Uh, then that's going to influence unethical behavior. So culture really is, you, you can't underestimate the, the role of culture here in, uh, in ethical decision making. And how does it influence people? It influences individuals through the socialization process. Now maybe you've experienced this before, but the first time you start to work for an organization, maybe it's your first day on the job or first week, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of comparison. You're, you're, and you're looking at that and you say, boy, they sure do things different around here than we did at my last job, right? Things are a lot different. It's like, wow, I can't believe they do that. Or, oh, this is really cool. They do it like that. So you're first aware when you come in to what the culture is like and in time uh, you begin to adopt that culture as your own and within you know three six nine months you don't even realize the culture anymore because you have been socialized and these are now your beliefs right so so there's this entry period and we'll talk a little bit about this more but there's this entry period by which people are socialized into the culture uh, at the front end now, this is a good model here, and those of you in my OB class may remember this, but uh, I like this model here. It shows how culture really is in two main areas. There's the observable things like the ceremonies, slogans, behavior, dress, physical settings, right? Uh, that's all the things that we can see about culture, but, but really sort of like the proverbial iceberg where 90% of it is underneath the water, you can't see a lot of it. And so the underlying values, assumption, beliefs, attitude, and feelings, and again, this probably what makes ethical decision making so challenging is because it's so tied into the culture and you can't really see the culture, right? And oftentimes we don't talk about these things. So if it's a culture which plays fast and loose with decisions, is unethical, well those aren't the kinds of things that you know usually get talked about, right? Because culture has to do with the unseen, uh, taken for granted sort of things. Now this model here uh, is sort of an overview over the rest of the the rest of the chapter and what we're going to talk about for the rest of the uh, lecture here. It's uh, what they call a multi-system approach, and you'll notice there's two systems there. There's the formal system on the left and the informal system on the right. And so the formal system uh, has to do with ethical. I'm sorry, executive leadership, the selection system, policies, codes, orientation, training, performance management, authority structure, and decision process. And then the informal system has to do with role models, heroes, norms, rituals, myth stories. Okay, so so you might say that the that the right uh, part, the informal system, has to do with those hidden, you know, the the bottom part of the iceberg sort of things. And then those both uh, lead to ethical or unethical behavior. Now you notice on the bottom there, there's a little. Uh, connector between those two, and it says alignment question mark. So what is this idea of alignment? Alignment and misalignment. Uh, with alignment, all systems are pushing employees in the same direction, either ethical or unethical. And with misalignment, all employees get mixed messages about expectations. Okay, so the point here is that, say for example, the formal system has policies and codes uh, about ethical behavior. Right. And for example, say, uh, you know, the policy says that uh, that it's important that we all show up on time, uh, that nobody takes uh, company property and that uh, we're all on our best behavior uh, in, in the office. Right. OK, great. That's the formal system. You say, OK, isn't that all we need? You know, as a manager, I just need a good policy to dictate people's behavior. Well, then there's the informal system and say there's a key sales guy. Right who's always coming in late, uh, who, you know, is taking stuff for his own use and uh, is, you know, kind of known as a, a scurrilous dude with, with the women, you know, he's, he's constantly making uh, suspect sort of comments and sexual harassment, innuendos, those kinds of things. Now, which of those two things do you think is going to be more of an influence on the people? Well, chances are it's going to be some of those 
uh, informal things, right? Because people, yeah, they read the policy, they read the code, they know that's important to management, but uh, you've got this really important key figure in the organization. He's a leader, so to speak, in an informal way, who is really setting the tone by his behavior. So is that an aligned system or an unaligned system? That's right. If you said misalignment, that is correct, right? So the policy says one thing, yet the informal system says another thing. So that's not a good thing. And uh, people can become cynical uh, if they see that sort of uh, misalignment. They say, man, management says we're supposed to do all this thing, but nobody really believes it. Nobody really does it. That's not a good system. Okay. So the key here for managers is to align your formal system with your informal system. Now, that doesn't mean you dumb down the formal system, right? So, okay, well, everybody's going to steal and sexual harass, so we'll just change our policy. No, you can't do that. You need then to work it on the informal system side. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, all right? So that's the idea here between alignment and misalignment is having those two working together. Now, uh, some of you may know that leadership really plays a key role in creating, uh, creating culture, especially executive leadership. Those are the top. Uh, the, the role of the founder uh, can be so critical in this regard, right? The founders of organizations set the tone. Uh, even beyond their own tenure, once they're gone, people will still be referring back to that person's uh, leadership uh, and the kind of influence that they set. All right. Uh, so, so executive leadership, really, that's the world they deal in. And Ed, Edgar Schein said, you know, the most enduring legacy uh, that a leader is going to leave for an organization is the culture that he leaves behind, he or she leaves behind. So you, you can't underestimate the role of leadership in setting the culture and they maintain and change an organizational culture and there's there's a few types of leadership uh, in terms of ethics that we could refer to here there's what could be called unethical leadership hypocritical leadership uh, or ethically neutral or silent leadership and we're going to dig into that in just a bit here now there's two pillars uh, which the ethical leadership rests now you can look at ethical leadership in terms of uh, the moral person and the moral manager. All right. Now, the moral person, this would be your person who, on his own personal time and as a person himself, him or herself, would, would tend to be, would be considered moral, right? So they have these traits like honesty, integrity, trust, uh, the behaviors they exhibit are openness, concern for people, uh, personal morality, right? Decision making is uh, values based and fair. And now, on the other hand, you have somebody who is a moral manager. And so it's not just about their own personal behavior, but it's about the way they, uh, they instruct others. So they tell followers how they should behave and they hold them accountable. And so this is done through role modeling, by taking visible ethical action, uh, by rewarding and disciplining, holding people accountable for their ethic, ethical conduct, and then communicating, sending an ethics and values type of message, right? So you can envision a, a scenario where somebody perhaps is a, a very moral person, right? Uh, maybe uh, they believe that it's important with their family and they teach their kids to be honest and all those sorts of things. But then they get to work and they're like, all right, all bets are off. And uh, so then they are, uh, they, they, they're no longer quite the moral person that they were when they come into the management role. They don't, they don't send ethics and values messages at work. They don't role model it. And, you know, some people, you know, let's face it, uh, some people believe that the business is a different context. Well, it's just business, you know, it's just work. And it doesn't really matter because this is the way the world of business works, right? Everybody does this. Everybody lies. Everybody cheats. Everybody tries to take advantage of other people. So that's sort of the mindset. You know, it's a bit Machiavellian, but that's kind of the mindset that some people have about business. And sadly, you know, that's why some people want to get into business because they feel like it's a, you know, an ethical free for all and they can kind of do what they want because, you know, the bottom line is the bottom line, right? If you can get ahead financially. So, all right. So let's take a look then if uh, excuse me. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, let's take a look then at this matrix, which sort of shows how these two can be aligned or unaligned and what type of, uh, what type of leadership this would lead to. Now, if you look at the upper left there, uh, where you have, there's two axes, by the way, there's a moral manager, strong and weak, and then a moral person, strong and weak. Now in the upper left here, the upper left quadrant, you see, uh, what's called the hypocritical leader. And this is somebody who, as a, as a, uh, uh, 
a moral manager, they might come down real strong upon things, but as a moral person, they are weak, right? So they, in their personal lives, it's okay to lie and cheat and steal, but in the work setting, they, they won't let anybody do that, right? So that's kind of hypocritical when you say one thing and you do another. Now, on the other hand, if you have somebody who is uh, a morally weak person and a morally weak, weak manager, that's an unethical leader. Now, on the top right quadrant, somebody who is a strong moral person and a strong moral manager, that would be considered an ethical leader. Now, you'll notice that the bottom one here doesn't have a name for it, but what the authors try to argue that is if you are a weak moral manager, whether or not you are a strong or weak person, that is uh, that can lead to ethically neutral leadership. So what does that mean? So, so say, for example, you are a strong moral person, all right, so the bottom right quadrant, and you believe that uh, it's, it's not right to steal, it's, you know, you need to treat people fairly and all those sorts of things. But then you come to work and you see things happening and you just don't say anything. You don't call people, you don't use language, right? You, you don't really manage as a, uh, as a moral manager. They would call that ethically neutral leadership and that's not good. Because to not say something is 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 a tacit impl uh, uh, you're tacitly implying that it's okay, right? So this is so important for leaders because if you don't say something, uh, people will assume that you think it's okay. So until you open your mouth and speak up and say, "Hey, that's not okay," uh, you're being an ethically neutral leader, and that is going to lead to uh, a bad ethical climate. So you need to set the tone as a moral manager to speak up and to voice your concerns. So how does this apply? How does this apply for those of us who are Christians? All right. So let's think about this for a second. Well, we have a pretty strong, you know, values-based, right? The deontological approach. We get our values from Scripture, and so we believe that lying is wrong. Right. So if we come to work and we believe that personally, yet, you know, we allow our, for example, our sales guys to, you know, fudge a little bit. Right. To use some morally ambiguous language. We, we allow them to lie. Right. Let's just use language. We allow them to lie to sell things to their customers. Right. Now, uh, is that a good thing? If you believe something personally, you know, are you going to feel good at the end of the day? Well, I, this is what I believe. You know, I believe that lying is wrong. Well, you know, you didn't really speak up at the job about that. And so you're not leading as a moral manager, right? So this is going to lead to some personal disconnect. And I, I personally believe that, you know, that, that a Christian in a work setting who just allows things to happen uh, is not going to be happy. And as, as a moral person, as a moral manager, you're, you're not doing your company any, any service, right? So uh, this could lead to all kinds of personal hangups and problems. And I know people leave work. Uh, I read some of your posts and you all say, yeah, I was at a job like that. And as a Christian person, I just couldn't handle that anymore. So I had to leave. All right. Enough said about that. Now, let's talk about some of the other formal cultural systems. Now, by the way, Trevino and Nelson refer to these as uh, cultural systems. Uh, some might take issue with that. I know that Bowman and Deal looks at some of these things in their Reframing Leadership book uh, as the structural frame, right? So these are part of the structure of an organization. So when you talk about uh, mission statements and policies and training, those, those aren't really culture per se. Uh, so I just want to make that distinction in case you're wondering, are these really cultural items? But for argument's sake, well, let's, you know, uh, to go along with the author's premise, we'll just consider these part of the culture. All right, so let's quickly go through some of these uh, some of these items here. So the first is the selection system, and this has to do with whether or not you bring ethics up in the front end when you're hiring somebody. So do you have any way of assessing uh, a potential candidate's uh, ethical disposition? And I believe the book has some great interview type of questions that you could ask somebody. Uh, to, to determine how the, you know have they how have they dealt with an ethical dilemma in their past work right so again this isn't foolproof right somebody could be kind of Machiavellian and it's kind of just play the system and tell you what they think you want to hear so they get the job but I think it sets the tone it lets candidates know that this is an ethical place and that we, we're concerned about that from all of our employees uh, then there's the values and mission statements and if not in the mission statement definitely in the value statement 
Uh, do you have a, a, a real explicit statement about your, your ethics and your values and what's important that this is an ethical organization, right? So you kind of build it into that top level so that people know that this is important and it guides decision making. And if you know you're a well-aligned organization, uh, your mission and your values really should drive a lot of what happens at the lower levels. Then there's policies and codes. Do you have things that are explicit about what you believe, about what you are going to, how you're going to handle uh, ethical issues, what's the process, what's the consequences uh, for those sorts of things. So it's important that your your approach and your your expectations in terms of ethics is written into policies and codes. Then there's orientation and training programs. Now, uh, earlier we talked about the socialization process that happens when people are first learning the culture, right? So this is a this is a great time to to set the tone for new employees right there at the orientation. Uh, Here's what we believe about ethics. Here's how things are going to be handled. Here's what we expect you to do. How's, here's how you deal with ethical uh, issues, right? And then training programs. And most organizations have some sort of ongoing training. Uh, do, do you deal with ethical issues in your training, right? So you send a strong message when you devote part of your training time. And I know this is an, it's, it's expensive and it's costly. And, you know, a lot of people wonder if it's worth it or whatnot. Uh, but the bottom line here is that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you, you need to deal with ethical issues in your training because you have to reinforce it. And this doesn't even necessarily have to be in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the formal training. Uh, sometimes small groups, managers get together on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Uh, do they talk about ethical issues? You know, for example, if, if there's something that's happened recently with another similar type of organization, uh, say you work in the automobile industry and all of a sudden, you know, uh, here we are, you know, October 2015, and we're talking about Volkswagen and how they, uh, you know, they deceive people on their emission standards, right? So if you're in the if you're in the automobile industry, boy, I'll bet you a lot of people are talking about that one in their big groups and their small groups, right? So can we use the the other guys, you know, the competitors, so to speak, uh, as as case studies and object lessons for us to talk about our own ethics? Um, then there's performance management systems. All right, so you guys know what those are. Uh, and these are changing a lot. I think the, the, the writing is on the wall for the traditional performance management systems. Uh, but basically, performance management systems take in uh, you know, different variables, different criteria for someone's performance and as a basis for whether they get a raise or in a promotion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so do you consider ethical issues? Now, say, for example, uh, you know, uh, Joe, you know, did a couple things that were considered questionable and they went to his file. And so performance management time, the manager has those things. And he said, well, Joe, you know, you did good. You made your numbers and <clears throat> your department came in under budget, whatnot. But uh, we have these items here that came up uh, where, you, you know, you didn't really uphold the company's values and you didn't really adhere to our policy in terms of these ethical issues. So uh, that's going to cost you uh, this promotion, right? Now Joe's going to get all mad and scream and kick, you know, and go postal. Well, hopefully that won't happen. But uh, but you get the point. You, you, so you have to let people know that there are consequences. And there's an old axiom in uh, management that you, is that you get what you reward, right? And so if you, if and conversely, you don't get what you punish. So if you don't reward and punish the right things, uh, you're not going to get it, and so the performance management system time is a good uh, system is a good way to reinforce that. Uh, then there's the authority organizational authority structure, which has to do with formal roles like the offices and the ombudsman. And then finally, there's the decision making process, and you know this has to do with do do you pause when it comes time to making big decision for the ethical implications of your decisions. Now, this could happen at real high levels, like in strategic planning, the strategic planning process, uh, maybe in smaller committee level work, uh, small groups, ad hoc teams, however your organization makes decisions. Uh, do you stop and think about the ethical implications of this decision? Now, there's not always one, but sometimes there is. And so a good moral manager is going to bring these up and say, hey, you guys, you know, there's an ethical dimension to this that we're not talking about, and here it is, right? So that's how you get people thinking about ethics in the job, and this is how you, you manage morally by making this part of the process. And I'm going to pause. Okay, so we just talked about the formal systems, but what about the informal cultural systems? And these are the things that really aren't necessarily part of the, the, the policy. It's not part of the value statements. They're not written anywhere. 
But nevertheless, they have a very strong influence over people's, uh, over the culture. And I would say these are more culture than the, the previous ones proper. But, but nevertheless, these are important things to pay attention to. So the first one here is role models and heroes. And as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes the founder is a very strong a hero in the organization and people talk about the the time that he did this or she did this you know uh, Herb Keller from uh, Southwest Airlines is kind of legendary in this regard right he's not the CEO anymore but people still talk about Herb there apparently and uh, and so the things that he did, the time that he went and visited a sick employee, uh, the way he treated employees, it's, that sets the tone. And so you, you talk about these, you kind of keep these stories alive uh, about the founders and, and, and you celebrate people who do the right thing. You know, so somebody uh, goes out of their way to make an ethical decision. If somebody, you know, takes a bullet, so to speak, in order for the company to, to make the right ethical decision, you have to hold those people up as heroes and, and, uh, and role models. And then, you know, think about the type of uh, tone that some people set, right? So if there's somebody who's very, you know, esteemed, he's a good, uh, he's a leader, uh, and if he's a good role model for people, that's, that's gold right there. You want those kinds of people that, that not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Then there's the norms, and norms is defined simply as the way we do things ar around here, right? It's sort of the unwritten rules, what's expected, right? So do the norms uh, reflect good ethics? Do people make good decisions in the day and day? Uh, is it part of the norm? Uh, sometimes, you know, the norm is, you know, like we talked about the misaligned organization, the norm really goes against the formal ethical system. So the policy says, yes, we show up on time and, uh, you know, we, we don't eat the food right out of the, out of the hopper. Well, that's what the policy says, but everybody knows that when the manager's not there or when the owner's not there, we come in when we want and we eat as much food as we want, right? So that, that would be the norm. The norm is, you know, the latter, right? And so that's how you get an unaligned system right there. So it's important to get those norms to support the formal system as well. And then there's the rituals, uh, the myths and the stories, and the language that you use to all align and support the uh, the formal system. And the language, let me just camp on that one for a little bit. We talked about this uh, previously, but language is so important, and especially if you're a manager, the kind of language you use to refer to things, right? So if you use morally ambiguous language, you know, and say things like, uh, well, we just sort of fudged the numbers, and uh, it was important that we, uh, that we augment uh, you know, our sales figures for the last quarter in order to, uh, you know, to uh, satisfy management. Well, you know, those are nice ways of saying we lied, right, that we lied about the truth uh, and we inflated our sales figures, even inflated, right? So that's language. So the type of language that you use is so important to set that tone, right? So be, be, a, be a straight shooter in this regard. And especially if you want to be a moral manager, don't let people get away with moral ambiguity in their language. Uh, the next section talks about the ethical climate. So climate is a little different than culture. Uh, culture is a little more long-standing, pervasive. Climate can tend to uh, ebb and flow. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, you, it's like think about the climate in your house. It can be cold one day, but you go and you crank up the heater and it's warm the next day. So what, is it, what does it feel like around here? What's sort of the immediate feeling that we have? Uh, and so some of the big ones here, is there, is there a climate of fairness, right? Do people perceive that this is the kind of place where they'll be treated fairly? Uh, is there a climate of benevolence? Are people nice to each other? Are they kind to each other? Are they respectful? Do they speak well of each other? Uh, is it a climate of self-interest, right? Is this the kind of place where people uh, try to get, you know, get look out for just for themselves, where they try to get ahead by stepping on other people? You know, is it like, you know, the, the, the tank of crabs and they're all trying to get to the top of the pile there by climbing on all the other crabs, uh, <laughs> right? So, and then principles. Is this a place where people stand on principles? and do what's best even when it may cost them personally or the organization, right? So those are kinds of things that, that speak of the climate, which are, uh, can develop an ethical climate. Uh, now, this is the, 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 the real question here. So you might be saying, oh, this is great. You know, I'd love to have an ethical culture in my organization. So how, you know, how do we go about changing the culture? Well, there's a couple directions here, obviously. And the book gave a couple of good case studies here uh, of going from an ethical to an unethical climate. And I believe that uh, Arthur Anderson was the, uh, the case study here. And if you recall, they were involved. Uh, they, were an, uh, they were an accounting firm. 
and uh, in time they, they took on more management consulting work and they worked for Enron and as you might envision you know doing somebody's books and auditing them uh, can be a conflict of interest when you're trying to help them grow and improve their business. So they got themselves into big trouble when they did that. And and Arthur Anderson Sr., the founder, was a very, you know, legendarily ethical, up, upfront kind of guy. And in time, as their business practices, you know, began to, you know, they had these conflict of interest types of things going on, um, it began to change. And so they went from being a very ethical organization to a very unethical organization. And they didn't start off that way. It's not like they had a meeting and said, all right, you guys, I know historically we've been ethical, but now we're going to become unethical. No, it doesn't happen like that, right? It happens sort of slowly, gradually uh, by making this decision and that decision. And before you know it, you wake up one day and you're an unethical organization. And so that's why all of these things kind of, you know, really thinking about the ethical implications of a decision. So imagine, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when they were sitting around and somebody said, hey, you know, this uh, organization uh, named Enron wants us to uh, begin doing some management consulting for them. And we're doing all their auditing right now, and it's pretty lucrative, and we could probably double our billings just by doing this. You know, well, our venal side says, yeah, hip hooray, let's take it on. But somebody, you know, where was the person saying, you know what, look, time out now. Uh, yes, we can make money doing this, but this could put us in a real serious conflict of interest situation that we might not want to get into. And so maybe we need to split up the company, you know, or kind of come up with different divisions, but they didn't. And uh, so in the long term, it ended up to being their demise because they were, they became culpable uh, right along with Enron for some of the things that happened because they were there. Uh, and they should have been the ones who were, you know, catching these things, but they didn't because they had a vested interest. And then from unethical to ethical, and this is a little bit more challenging, uh, let's talk about how you might change an organization from an ethical culture, from an unethical to ethical. Well, there's no easy answer here, folks. Uh, you have to take a long-term view of something like this. Culture, because it's so pervasive, because it's so tied into the founder and those kinds of things, it's going to take a long time. A uh, long time to change. Now you, you need to start, and you start by changing some of those uh, some of those formal systems, right? So some of the formal things like the onboarding, uh, the performance management, the policies, the codes, the training orientation. You know that's how you sort of build it into the system. You think about all these different systems that we have that support each other and how they're interrelated, and say. How do we begin to change those so that they start to change the overall culture and the formal system? Uh, you need to diagnose and audit. The book has a couple of great uh, uh, tools there. And again, this isn't easy to get to, but you have to take a real qualitative you know, look and you have to ask questions and you have to really ask people uh, some of these diagnostic questions. And you know, if I were to set up, okay, as a researcher, if I was to set up something like this, what I would do is is I would do I would do the audit at the beginning, and uh, get a baseline, right? And say, okay, where are we on all these things? You know, see if you could quantify it. So if I'm going to scale one to four, you know, how are we as an ethical organization using some of these tools? Ah, uh, we're about at you know 2.5. It's not horrible, but there's room for improvement. And then you do some of these innovation interventions, and you change. You say, for example, you change the uh, the the orientation and the new employee orientation and training. Uh, you change your performance management system so that it reflects ethical issues, right? You add a value statement that uh, has something to do with ethics. And then you, you, you roll those things out, and then you reassess and use the exact same tool uh, in a year or in a couple of years. And, and hopefully you've seen that you've moved from a 2.5 to, you know, maybe a 3.2. Well, you know, there you go. There you celebrate it, and you have evidence that you've actually changed uh, the ethical culture, right? So this is what's called in research vernacular as a re, as a experimental design, and you can actually show evidence, right? So you have some baseline, you change, and then you reassess and show that you're changing, all right? So so there's a way to actually diagnose uh, your culture and to give evidence that you have changed the culture uh, by making interventions. Uh, I guess I just talked about all this, right? So you intervene. Uh, you make those changes and then you reevaluate, right? So this is how you kind of systematically think about the culture, how you can change the culture. Well, wasn't that a lot of fun? I know I went pretty fast through that and it kind of was long, but hopefully it was helpful to you. 
to think through culture in terms of ethics. This week, we have a couple of great discussion questions. I gave you some options whether or not you want to do a case study or whether or not you want to evaluate your own organizational culture uh, through some of these diagnostic tools uh, that are provided for you. So those of you that have been in an organization for a while, perhaps you're even in a management position, you say, yeah, I'd like to do a bit of a, uh, of a cultural audit for my own organization. You might want to take on that uh, discussion thread. So it should be lots of fun. So anyhow, that's all I got for you this week. Blessings to you all, and we'll see you online. Thank you.